The Telegraph. The Telegraph. Podcasts. Professor Pat Price is one of Britain's leading oncologists, having specialised in cancer treatment for 33 years. Pat has an international reputation in the molecular imaging of tumour biology, and she co-edits the UK standard textbook of oncology, Treatment of Cancer, now in its seventh edition. Pat Price founded and is chair of trustees of the national charity Radiotherapy UK and is the secretariat for the all-party parliamentary group on radiotherapy. In 2010, Pat returned to Imperial College as visiting professor in oncology, where she's involved in extraordinary large-scale international research. During the COVID pandemic, Professor Pat Price set up the high-profile Catch Up With Cancer campaign to lobby the government for a new national cancer recovery plan. In recent weeks, listeners will probably have heard Pat making increasingly passionate, even desperate attempts, appealing for action to tackle the UK's catastrophic cancer backlog. So I began by asking Pat Price, on a scale of 1 to 10, How bad is the UK's cancer crisis? It's certainly 10. It is the worst cancer crisis ever. And the problem is, it's getting worse and worse every day. And I don't see how, unless they do something very radical, how it's going to not continue to get worse. And of course, it's really important, these delays, for every four weeks delay in cancer treatment, there's on average a 10% reduction in survival. Yes, I was going to say to you that there were 5,000 patients waiting that long for cancer treatment in June 2021. So it's doubled since June 2021. Why is it getting worse? Well, it's entirely predictable that it's getting worse. And we have been warning about that since the beginning of the pandemic. Obviously, the start of COVID was a great trauma for the NHS. But remember, we had the lowest survival of Western countries before we went into the pandemic. And then obviously, the first few months of the pandemic, nobody knew what was happening. And that's all forgivable. But we were very clear early on, you mustn't stop cancer treatment, you must just crack on with it. And there was a sort of approach to it that if you didn't need to treat, see if you can delay. And then that sort of got inbaked in the system. And then, of course, patients did what they were told to do. They stayed at home. And then into the second year, we have the GPs have difficulties. So patients, if they did present, they couldn't get appointments. And by this time, the hospitals had bigger delays. So the whole thing has just got gummed up the system. So our delay and the backlog of cancer patients has just got worse and worse. And we're not even getting as many through now as we should. So when that backlog does come forward, we just don't have the treatment capacity. So this is going to get worse unless the government do a complete handbrake turn and completely change their attitude to the cancer crisis. As you say, Pat, during the lockdowns, the public was given that perhaps fatal instruction, stay at home, support the NHS. Many senior doctors like you warned quite clearly that people not coming forward with symptoms could have catastrophic consequences, particularly for diseases like cancer. I remember vividly a Panorama programme in July 2020, which warned that services like radiotherapy and scans were being paused. Pat, why were so many British screening programmes and treatments paused when that doesn't seem to have happened in other comparable countries? Yes, Panorama programme, of course, was led by Deborah James, who sadly... Yes, And it was. she made the very good point that cancer patients shouldn't be a collateral of the COVID crisis. And I think we just lacked that 200% commitment to absolutely doing everything that was going to get everything back. Screening programmes, get anybody you can presenting, do what we needed to do. We had been calling right at the beginning for it to be like that vaccine moment that the government said, this is a major issue. Get somebody in charge of it, cast away all bureaucracy and get on with it. And we didn't get that. For the first nine months, we had the NHS senior management saying they didn't know 
if there was a backlog. They didn't know how big it was. And it was only actually when David Javid came to be health secretary nearly two years in, did somebody say, oh, there's a problem. Let's have a war on cancer. Too late. Why wasn't there a think tank in the government and the NHS that said, OK, we're going to have this massive problem. What do we do? And start now. It is never too late to start. But it then didn't get started. After nine months, we had a so-called recovery group and we were going to get better by March 2021. No action points in it, just hope. And then that failed. And the next year, we were going to get better by March 2022. And even this year, in the Queen's speech, we're going to get better by March 23. What? How are you going to do that if you don't do anything? And I think now it's just got into the too difficult to deal with pile. And also the whole of the NHS, everything in a complete crisis. So now, where is cancer in the overall crisis? In fact, I think cancer's fallen off the agenda. All we hear is quite rightly accident emergency and all these other things. All backlogs are bad, but cancer is the most deadly backlog and it's the most time critical. So somehow we've got to get this back on the agenda. I know it's a difficult problem, but you know, when you're going down the wrong road, it's never too late to stop and actually go down the right road. On Planet Normal, we've heard from radiographers saying that before, where they would have found stage one and stage two cancers, patients are now coming in with stage four cancer and often being sent straight to palliative care. As you know, Pat, that means the cancer is often too far advanced to be treated. I just want to ask, in your experience, how common is that tragic situation? And um, what are we talking about now in terms of increased deaths? Is it hundreds? Is it thousands? Oh, there will be tens of thousands of cancer patients who will then lose their lives prematurely because of this. We were already seeing patients coming through late, right in the first six to eight months. We see that all over the place. It's terribly disheartening for frontline staff because they know that difference. And again, once you go over a tipping point, if you've got the spread, then it can't be cured. And of course, also, that means that we actually often we have to do more treatment for patients. So then again, we're running out of treatment capacity. It's a sort of vicious circle. Once you go on that downward spiral, it's not only a more patient's lives going to be lost, but you actually can't catch up and get back to where you needed to be. And I'm like you, I don't understand why nobody saw this coming. You've said it very well, but I just want to say it for Planet Normal listeners. Men, women, even children are dying this very day simply because we can't organise ourselves to give them treatment. That's correct, is it, Pat Price? Absolutely right. And we shouldn't be the sort of country that patients die because we can't organise ourselves to give treatment on time. Liam and I heard a while ago from a listener called Nick Stokes, who told us that his wife, Joy, she'd recovered several years ago from breast cancer. And Joy, during lockdown, developed terrible pain in her hip. Over many months, Joy tried and tried and failed to get an appointment with her GP. By the time Nick went down to the surgery to bang on the door, demanding painkillers for his wife, Joy's cancer had spread to her spine and she very sadly died soon afterwards. Joy was appallingly let down by primary care and her GP surgery acknowledged that. We know for a fact that there was a huge decrease in GP referrals during the pandemic. How much, Pat, was that partly to blame for the cancer backlog? And do you think GP referrals are now back up to where they should be? It's a tragic story, isn't it? One we hear all over the place. I don't want to blame individual GPs here because it is a systems failure. But this is what we hear all around the time. But remember, our delays are at every stage of the process. It's patients feeling they can't present yet or being too frightened, not being able to get GPs appointments, then referrals in are taking too long. And then when they get in their pathology departments for the biopsies are back long, so they are taking too long, then the diagnostic services to get the biopsies, all this type of thing and the scanning, and then to see the surgeons or to see the radiotherapists, it's delays throughout the whole process. 
And that's the problem. And it is a systems error. But we also know that at great cost, the state requisitioned all of the private hospitals in the country. They were not being used. As it happens, about 18 months ago, I had a suspected lump in my breast. I was referred to our private hospital, which was still doing scans. They cleared that up, Pat, in a day and a half. Why on earth were we not using the private hospital's capacity that the British taxpayer had paid for? And are we now not missing a trick by basically doing the same again, requisitioning the private hospitals to accelerate the treatment, to clear up that backlog? This is absolutely one way to help. And this is, again, it shows us without the leadership and with the bureaucracy, it's just not happening. We wrote to Matt Hancock the 1st of April 2020, two weeks into lockdown, and said he must use that private sector. And was the private sector used for cancer? It wasn't particularly. And the problem was the leadership in the NHS devolved it to local areas to decide if they were going to purchase services from the private sector. And of course, if you devolve it round to trusts, then they're dealing with COVID patients coming in the door. They had all this issue. And again, there was nothing coming down from above, was there, that there's a cancer crisis. So nothing really got requisitioned there. And in fact, one of the private sector cancer providers with four cancer centres throughout the country went into administration. That is just madness. And yet, of course, patients who have got the money now are paying for it themselves to have their treatment. So we've heard a lot, Pat, about the extra billions which are being put into the NHS for COVID catch-up. We know we're having this national insurance rise and that's supposed to be billions of pounds for the NHS. Now, Pat, you are co-founder of the Catch-Up with Cancer campaign with 35 other oncologists you've written to, health ministers calling for urgent action, including an expansion in radiotherapy services. Is this catch-up money, this vast sum of catch-up money, Is it getting through to the front line or if not, where the hell is it going? Well, certainly in radiotherapy, we're not seeing it. We were given a small 32 million to buy a few new treatment machines last year. But this is nowhere near what is needed. Most of the money that's been announced has been for the elected backlog. There's been specific money for diagnostic radiology, which is really welcomed, which is great. But we heard only a couple of weeks ago, some of that money is now going to be clawed back so that it can pay for pay rises. So they're giving with one hand and taking with the other. But our point is, you've also got to increase treatment capacity. And there has been no money for that. You've got to increase treatment capacity. There's no way around it. And remember, that means people and it means equipment. And what is so distressing is we have had countless summits, letters in. It's not as though nobody's got any idea. And it's a system where now it's so bureaucratically heavy and we're even having more bureaucracy added in on the top. The frontline staff have been stifled. They give ideas. They're told to basically be quiet about them. You should flip it entirely on its head. You should empower the staff to do all those things they need to. This is an absolute national emergency. They should be doing all this and then also give them the tools they need. Take, for instance, in radiotherapy. Government are missing an absolute trick here. Nobody seems to understand what radiotherapy is. Of course, when we treat cancer, it's either surgery or systemic therapy, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, or it's radiotherapy. The two curative treatments are mainly surgery and radiotherapy. Radiotherapy is needed in one in two patients, and it's needed in 40% of cures. So if you don't have a good radiotherapy service, you don't really have a good cancer service. And yet it has been strangled for so many years now. There's only about 6,000 professionals in the whole country treating over 100,000 patients a year on about 350 machines. It is extremely cheap treatment. It costs about £4,000 to be cured with radiotherapy compared with some immunotherapy drugs. It's £100,000, of course. We could actually slash through radiotherapy waiting lists and also some surgical lists if we got a proper plan rather than just everybody thinking they don't know what to do. There are solutions out there, but nobody seems to understand the magnitude of the problem. And so it gets worse every day. What strikes me as being so short-sighted, Pat, is 
these people are dying and some of them are dying younger, their mothers, their fathers, not just the cost in heartbreak, but the cost to the system, isn't it? To their children, to their wider families, to the benefits that are needed. It's not just about cancer statistics, is it? It's actually about vast knock-on costs to society as a whole, isn't it? Yes, and I think, remember, cancer affects everybody. One in two people are going to get cancer. This is an awful time to get cancer, and it affects so many, it touches so many. It's bad enough having cancer without knowing that you just can't get the treatment you need on time. And then we talk about research breakthroughs. We don't need that at the moment. We just need to give normal treatment on time. And that's why, in some ways, I have to think to myself, why have I put so much effort into that? But right from the very first day of lockdown, we were having people phone up in desperate situations. Where do I go? My operation's been cancelled. I was so distressed about it. It's just not fair on cancer patients. And somebody's got to stand up for them. What we're calling for, really, is we want to meet with the new Secretary of State, come with some world-class frontline people, give them some solutions. It doesn't have to be this way. But it will be if you keep ignoring the frontline staff, ignoring the situation and ignoring it so bad. I think the problem is, you know, when we had COVID, of course, it was so distressing to see those patients breathing on ventilators. And you see patients now in ambulances. But the trouble is cancer patients are just dying quietly at home, aren't they? And will do so in the future. It's not as visible. And so how do we make sure that they're given as much priority as all these other things? Interestingly, when we had the media a couple of weeks ago and I was speaking on the radio, I had no end of doctors from around the country saying, at last somebody's spoken up. Because there is obviously this, if you work for the NHS, you're not supposed to speak up. I think the time is now to actually call it out. This is not acceptable. It has gone past it. It's not acceptable. And if you don't do anything, I don't know how it can get better. Well, by the powers vested in me by Planet Normal, Professor Price, I am giving you today unlimited manpower and funds to sort the cancer crisis. If we had whoever is the new health secretary, what do they do on day one? Exactly what we did with the vaccine. We make sure we've got right from the top the PM's approval. You go away and do what you like. You get a team in there of all the good and great who know what to do. You cast away your bureaucracy. You use the data, get every single best brain in it and actually empower the frontline staff, give them the tools and don't accept no for an answer. If you get radiotherapy centres equipped properly, they can give treatment, put them in the diagnostic hubs, get them nearer to home. And if you empower all that work Force, they will find ways of getting it through the system, getting those scans done, giving the priority, but it will need investment. How much do you think? What are we talking about to get it really up and running? Well, we know we need 850 million in radiotherapy and the surgery and diagnostics. I think we probably need a couple of billion, but that's not a lot of money. And the problem is, if you don't spend that money, you're going to be spending far more money. So this is actually going to save you money in the end. Well, there are, let's remind ourselves. There were pre-pandemic around 167,000 people who died of cancer in the UK every year. And from what you're telling me, I wouldn't be at all surprised if, you know, due to this appalling state of affairs, if we could be even looking at double that. Do you think that's possible, Pat? Some people have put it as high as that. Um, A lot will depend on what happens from here on in. But it's not good news. This is just a disaster. It's in the too difficult to deal with pile now. Well, I know I speak for all Planet Normal listeners and Telegraph readers. Thank you for the absolutely righteous fuss you're making because it is disgraceful. Professor Pat Price, thank you so much for coming aboard the rocket this week. We should mention we've had sight, haven't we, of an interview that Rishi Sunak's given to The Spectator. Of course, The Spectator isn't published as we're currently recording but it will be out when planet normal is released on thursday and it really is a quite astonishing intervention by the former chancellor possibly his last roll of the leadership dice 
Yes, Fraser Nelson, editor of The Spectator, has this astonishing interview to be published in this week's Spectator. And Sunak is basically blowing the lid off what happened with lockdown in government. He begins by saying that Chris Whitty and Patrick Vallance openly admitted at the start that lockdown could do more harm than good. But as the evidence started to come in, there was a strange silence descended in government. The policy, as Sunak describes it, was see no evil. And Sunak, I mean, there's absolutely astonishing quotations in the Spectator interview. I wasn't allowed to talk about the trade-off, says Sunak. Ministers were briefed, Liam, by number 10 on how to handle the questions about the side effects of lockdown. And the script was never to acknowledge that there were any side effects. And the number 10 strategy, Sunak says, was to create the impression that lockdown was a scientifically created policy which only crackpots, that's crackpots like you and me, co-pilot, would dare to question. And he ends by saying in this astonishing spectator interview, we shouldn't have empowered the scientists the way that we did. We should have acknowledged the trade-offs from the start. And coming back to what Pat Price was saying, Sunak talks about trying to raise. We didn't talk at all about the missed doctor's appointments or the backlog in the NHS in a massive way. That was never part of it. When I did try to raise those concerns, I met a brick wall. Those meetings were literally me around the table, just frightening. It was incredibly uncomfortable. He recalls one meeting when he raised education. I was very emotional about it. I was like, forget about the economy. Surely we can all agree that kids not being in school is a major nightmare. There was a big silence afterwards. It was the first time anyone had said anything. I was so furious. 